Um, so if you're making it out of something like bamboo, <clears throat> you're going to wind up in a position where uh, you have an enormous number of um, people that need shelter, but only a limited amount of local bamboo. And the fact that you're working inside of an industrial paradigm where you're actually doing mass production as a core part of the hexiart is the part of the story that we don't normally talk about. And the reason that I'm going to go into some depth in this today is because everything to do with centralization and industrialization is now a key political issue because of what we've seen with the entire Snowden mess. Does that kind of make sense? So what I thought was going to be a very simple talk about technology is now going to be substantially more political, and I'm going to wind up making up quite a lot of it as I go along. So, you know, excuse me if there's chaos, but that's just the deal we have today. Um, right, let's get started. Um, the way that the world works right now is a really simple breakdown. Roughly two billion of us are rich and live in cities. There's another billion of us who are dirt poor and live in these kind of slums, which are cities with informal infrastructure. The cities with informal infrastructure are where most of the economic growth is happening in the world because that's the place where there's the kind of chaos which is deeply creative. And the lack of creative chaos is the great strangling that you see when we talk about copyright and patent. So if you think of the slums as being the place where there's very, very weak state and therefore extremely high economic growth, you can begin to see that the internet in some ways is a digital slum. It's a place where for a long time, because there was no way to make money on the internet, nobody really cared what happened there. Now, in the world that we currently live in, we're at something like four to eight times consumption of basic resources. And this is a very crude number. It covers land use, it covers water use. It's absolutely a wild ass guesstimate. And a little bit later, we'll talk about a specific resource, copper, and how serious the shortages of copper are and what that really means for our culture. Um, once you understand that we're at four to eight times consumption, a really, really big change happens in your understanding of how the world works. Because for us to have a planet in which everybody has a, a basic standard of living is going to require us to cut our standard of living by a factor of four to 10, or at least our resource use, um, or we're going to face an absolutely enormous conflict because we will continue to consume an enormous amount of resources, everybody else will be on the edge of starvation, and will be interconnected by a single large global network, basically the internet. Does this kind of make sense so far? Right? We're not in the world that we think we're in. The world that we think we're in is that our standard of living is kind of normal, natural, sustainable, reasonable, and so on. But actually, it's the product of roughly 500 years of colonial expansion and military domination by Europeans. We got to gunpowder and industrial production first. We basically enslaved the entire world. And the standard of living that we have is produced by unfair trade, occasional war, and huge burning of natural resources. So we're kind of sitting in a house which is on fire discussing what furniture we're going to buy next year. And it's that radical reframing of how the world works which gives the opportunities for political change in a way which is directly continuous from everything to do with centralized production right the way through to why we can't get rid of the NSA without getting rid of capitalism too. Right. Now, let's return to the practical for a second. <clears throat> the Hexier is a really simple technology. It's really simple because most of the complexity is outsourced to the manufacturing process. So because we can buy insulated panels for 20 euros a sheet, as long as you're willing to make things that it's easy to make with insulated panels, boom, you can make hexiarts, right? The wall is a whole industrial panel. The roof piece is half an industrial panel. You can make them out of different kinds of industrial panel. This one is uh, plywood, right? Same geometry. You could fit a lot of people in them. I mean, we'd be much cooler if we had hexiarts here, right? Next year, next year. Um, you can make larger ones, different geometry. You can make really large ones, same components, 
over and over and over again for an entire range of structures. And this thing is basically a free, it's run like a free software project. No copyright, no patent, no budget. We give away the designs. Uh, about 1,000 units were built last year at Burning Man. All of the complexity of this project is in the materials manufacturing and the materials logistics. The actual construction process is cut some panels in half and attach them. If it's wood, you use screws. Uh, if it's a foam panel, you use tape. But all of the embedded complexity that makes the Hexart project possible is access to high-tech materials. Does this kind of make sense? Now, once we accept that the Hexier is just an extrusion of industrial civilization, it's a little kind of node on this enormous global manufacturing network, it becomes much clearer what it is that makes it special. It's the raw industrial form of shelter. Here's the enormous high-tech industrial infrastructure, and it's the absolute minimum you can do to turn high-tech industrial infrastructure into shelter. Um, that's just a nice picture to give you a sense of scale. Um, once you begin to see that, the fact that at the end of the process, you can do the manufacturing step with very simple tools, doesn't change the fact that the panel materials are made in enormous centralized factories that are integral parts of the whole kind of global trade system. When we start talking about how to change the world, if we ignore the industrial tail that makes it possible to produce ultra-cheap shelter, we haven't actually solved the problem. So right now, the Hexiart is in exponential growth. They're doubling every year from a start of one in 2003. Uh, last year at Burning Man, there were at least 750 units we could count from the air, and probably as many as another 250 to 500 of the smaller units that we couldn't count. Uh, test units in Sri Lanka, test unit in Haiti, lots of interest in people beginning to build them in permanent applications. The thing is spreading. My guess when I started this project was that it was going to take 15 years to go from the first hex year to the first large-scale deployment in a refugee camp, um, partly because you need a kind of generational turnover when you're going to go from the sort of... Um, you know, radical new vision to the mainstream, usually if you grow up around an idea, you think it's mainstream, and then when you become adult, you deploy it. But if you're in a position where a new idea arrives and you're working at a conservative industry, it's very hard to change your mind about how things work. So, imagine a world in which the vast majority of the human race lived in hexiarts. So rather than having 40 tons of fired brick, steel, glass, uh, concrete, and all of these other expensive materials arranged in an incredibly inefficient form, which is an accident of history with terrible engineering and manufacturing properties, right? could we actually do one house like that as a minimum human right for every human being in the world? It's a question, it's an engineering question. So we take an average occupancy of say three people, so nine billion divided by three, three billion. We need 12 sheets of material for each hexier, so that's 36 billion sheets, and typical weight for a sheet is something like four kilos. So can we make roughly 100 billion kilos or 100 million tons of hexiart panels? Well, yes, right? There are lots of different ways you can do it. Probably the most efficient way of doing it is aluminum foil, very thin aluminum foil, over thick industrial cardboard. The panels are machine sealed, they last forever because the aluminum protects them from the sun and the UV and the water, and the cellulose is incredibly stable as long as it's protected from those things. If the panel fails, you rip the aluminum off and recycle it, and you compost the cardboard. So I don't know of another way that we could produce housing for the entire world. There aren't really enough natural materials to do it in most places. People live in very simple, very primitive mud huts, and they're very uncomfortable, and the standard of living is very low. Do you begin to see the way that we're looking at this? 
right? You have a situation where you start talking about how the future works, and you begin to wind up with these enormous numbers for raw materials consumption, and those numbers never really come up. When people are talking about things like energy policy, they always talk about relative to current consumption, right? Our use is up 2%, our use is down 2%. Even the environmental movement talks about up 2%, down 2%. They never talk about if everybody in the world consumed this much, how many planets of consumption would be using because the number is so terrifying. And there's only really two ways this can go. Either we find a way of providing what everybody needs in a way that works for everybody and is acceptable within the actual standard of living that we have, or we find some kind of situation where uh, you have an enormous difference between the access to resources of the rich and the poor and constant conflict in society to manage that uh, disparity. And that's the position we have right now. Right? We're at the head end of an extremely su successful empire We've been part of the colonial process our entire lives, even if we didn't fully acknowledge it. And if we want to talk about solving the political problems that come with empire, we have to solve the problem of our own resource consumption, because otherwise we depend on the empire to keep us wealthy, even though we feel oppressed by the existence of the empire. Do you see how this kind of closes into a loop? Right? On one hand, we are complaining about the NSA and the terrible actions of the American government. On the other hand, we drove here in two tons of steel running on oil that was taken at gunpoint from one country or another. Right? Iran, you know, the, the great you know, demon that is being set up for the next war, Iran had a democratically elected government in 1953, which was overthrown by the CIA because they nationalized the oil reserves. Right? We live in a system which requires somebody to be oppressed for us to have our standard of living. And when we are the people that become oppressed by that system, we complain. But it is probably much easier to end the system of oppression completely than it is to change who is oppressed in the system. Right? If you want to get rid of the NSA, it starts with the fundamental resource consumption processes of our societies. And this is something which is not technologically soluble in the sort of nanotech, biotech, uh, singularitarian future. So right now, one of the paths out of this is that we go up a technology curve to the point where we can basically 3D print chicken sandwiches, as Smari says. The problem is that if you can 3D print chicken sandwiches, you can also 3D print landmines. And in all probability, we will not accept a society in which it's possible to 3D print landmines in high school. So you wind up with a system of restrictions on your 3D printers to prevent them producing weapons or drugs that we don't agree are legal or whatever it happens to be. You know. And at that point, you now have a new control structure which is regulating the means of production on which your society operates. And it's bad enough for 3D printers, it's massively worse when you get to nanotechnology or synthetic biology. So even with extremely powerful new manufacturing technology, we do not necessarily get to freedom. You just get to a different set of restrictions. So the other path is to find an extremely low resource, low risk mechanism where all of the essential needs of human beings can be met in a way that doesn't require this uh, enormous uh, colonialist or imperialist or capitalist structure to hold the disparities in place. And then once in a while, the people on the losing end of that are us. OK, now let me check and see whether we've got any questions on the thing. OK, any questions? No? OK, so moving swiftly on. Find the damn slide. What the hell has it done with my slides? Sodding Macintoshes. Oh, box. <sighs> Sorry, it's really hot. You know, it, it's been a really fun week. Uh, there we are. Right. Now, uh, let me step forward. So, let's talk about this in a really simple place where it hits us all, which is finding housing. The mortgages that we have, many of us, some of us, um, 
basically have gone up in value by what to two times in the past 20 years in most countries, at least most of the sort of rich industrial countries. All of that money is being pulled out of other parts of the society. So if you have you know, $100 million in a bucket, if real estate is in this kind of extremely booming kind of mode and you build more housing, most of the value in that housing is actually speculation value. The value is not in the bricks and mortar, it's not in the services that are produced. Because the house is in central London or central Amsterdam, it has value. Exactly the same house in central Poland would be worth 10% as much. Now, that 90% of value difference between these two scenarios, all of that is speculative value. It's just vapor. It's, it's just a ghost. So what's happened is that all of our capital has been poured into the building industry because as everything else got cheaper, you know, uh, technology got cheaper, communications got cheaper, energy got cheaper, manufacturing got more efficient. As all of these other things got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, housing stayed expensive and it took up a proportionally larger and larger and larger part of our total economic output. Everything else has been starved for capital for generations because the housing market was pulling more and more and more of the wealth in society into buildings that were badly engineered and haven't changed in basically 60 years, we'd stopped investing in industrial capacity, we stopped investing in education, we stopped investing in research and development, we stopped investing in science. All of the money went into bad engineering and speculation. So now, look at the possibility of doing extremely cheap, mass-produced, environmentally friendly, environmentally stable open source housing. There's a possibility to disrupt the housing market. We could do to housing what the previous generation did to fax machines. Right? You know that little gif that you see floating around that says, you know, you wouldn't download a car, and then there's a picture of a reprop, and it says, just you bloody wait. I should have it on here, but I don't, right? Um, so that's the position that we're actually in with housing, right? I mean, the Hexier is an early stage project. It probably needs 10 more years of work to the point where we could get it to the point where you could buy a kit that was designed in a completely open process for 15,000 euros, put it up in a weekend with your friends and live in it. But that's the long-term vision. Right? Let's just kill the conventional housing market. It's terrible obsolete technology. It's bad for our culture. It's not scalable to the rest of the world. It's producing enormous amounts of conflict within and around our societies. It's a disaster. You have a question? Uh, come to the microphone. If, if in general, if people have questions, so please put them on the etherpad. So killing a housing market is quite difficult because you need to have a lot to put something. And then you need to have a permit that you're allowed to put your ugly uh, um, um, aluminium stuff yes. there. Yes. Yes. And then next to you, there's a big villa. And the, and the people say, what's that ugly stuff there? It has to be removed. And so you get a little bit of uh, problems there. You're you are absolutely correct. And then you have the problem that if you have a um, dense l uh, area where they have maybe 20 uh, story houses where all the poor people live, um, then how do you want to make this? You need, need steel frames and things like that and you get into uh, constructing something that, that they have. So the GDR made some efficient housing, mm -hmm. but the people didn't like it or the, because they are made from concrete, uh, ready finished parts. Mm -hmm. But it was quite intelligent because you could uh, remove some panels and you were, were, were able to, to fix the piping because they were not uh, uh, put under the concrete, but just, just, just remove some panels and you could mm -hmm. service that. Yes. But so ev right. everything you say is correct. Yeah. Right? So for low density rural housing, the problem is very easy. For high density urban housing, the problem is very hard. Right? And I'm not suggesting that the first thing that we approach as an open source housing project is cities. Cities are difficult. Um, but fully 50% of the world lives in rural areas, and many of us would quite like to have a more rural life. It is possible. Now, um, this I will come back to. So once you have housing, right, you just have a shell. What else do you need in order to be able to cover the rest of your needs? 
it depends on the climate that you're in, it depends on what your personal needs are, it depends on uh, your chosen standard of living, your technology base, your industry, all of these things. So, this is a model called uh, Six Ways to Die, and it's part of a thing called SKIM, Simple Critical Infrastructure Maps. Lists the ways that people die. Too hot, right? Too cold, hunger, thirst, illness, injury. And there are seven tiers of political organization which are mapped in this system. Individual, household, village, town, region, country, and world. So it's a super simple abstract model of the system that keeps you alive, not mapped in physical space, but mapped in political space. So we get out here, right? What's keeping us, uh, let's say, warm in winter, although it's hard to imagine now, is a heating system that connects to a power system that connects to the international energy markets. So every time you, you know, turn on the heating in winter, you're turning on you know, a service that's directly connected to this enormous structure of global capitalism. And then the enormous structure of global capitalism is maintained largely by the force of the American government and to some degree the Europeans and the Chinese. And then their intelligence services protect that status quo from any kind of disruption. Do you see what I'm saying? It's the closing of the loop between the provision of critical infrastructure and the need for a defense and security service which gets in your lives that is the core tension at the heart of why we don't seem to be able to make real progress against these forces. As long as we are dependent on a system of global oppression to give us cheap natural resources and to maintain the wealth disparity between us and the poor of the world, those systems of oppression serve our basic needs and as a result we cannot get free of them. Right? The snake is eating its own tail. And the only way of getting out of this is to get into a position where we are no longer dependent as a culture and as a civilization on the standing means of political oppression for our basic survival needs. Right? The solution to the war in Iraq was to stop driving. But not one or two of us, all of us. If the Stop the War Coalition, rather than having two million people go out for one day, had simply turned London into an area where cars didn't drive for a year because everybody commuted to work on bicycles, a real message would have been sent. But it's not about sending a message, it's about finding a way of life which doesn't require the NSA to protect the state, to protect us from the people that we're ripping off to make a living. Now, Shall we go a little further down the rabbit hole here? Right? How many of you have a computing device which contains components manufactured in China? Right. Now, do Chinese people get to vote? No, not in a substantial way. Do they get to form unions to protect their interests against their employers? No. Do they have first-class protections of their human rights? Do they get to work reasonable hours for reasonable wages? Do they get collective bargaining? No. So we're fighting for free software running on top of hardware produced by slaves. This is exactly the same paradox of the American founding father Thomas Jefferson talking about human liberty while living on a farm where slaves did most of the manual labor. We're in exactly the same position that Jefferson was in. The tools that we are using to talk about liberty are being produced by people who are fundamentally unfree. And this goes right to the heart of our problem. We can no longer trust the hardware because the hardware is produced by the machinery of oppression which we are attempting to challenge by writing software. And as you all know, you can write the best software in the world, but if it's running on an untrusted hardware platform, really good luck with your privacy and security. How are we going to reclaim electronics manufacturing from non-free states? How do we make sure that every human being involved in the production of your laptop or your cell phone 
had political freedom and chose to manufacture it rather than not having political freedom and being forced into it by their government or even by economic pressure. How much do you think it would cost for a fair trade laptop? Right? 5,000 euros, 2,000 euros? We don't know. Do you know about Fairphone? Fairphone is a company that's attempting to produce a fair trade phone. So far, it looks like the price is going to be fairly manageable. Yes? Just a moment ago, you spoke about either being forced by their government mm. or by economic pressure. Yes. Um, is it conceivable that you would ever live in a society where people aren't forced to do things by economic pressure? If I live on my own on a sustainable farm in the middle of nowhere, I am forced to farm to feed myself by the economic pressure of needing to eat. Mm -hmm. Don't we all choose to work in part of a society where we can sustain ourselves based on the economic pressure of needing resources? Um, so, yes and no. So the distinction here is about the meaning of the word force, which gets into the whole question of libertarian political theory about whether or not um, economic coercion is still coercion. The question is, at what point will the state deploy violence or will other people deploy violence to compel your behavior? So if you're in a position where you're compelled by the laws of nature to get up and farm, it's very difficult to change the system in such a way the laws of nature no longer apply to you. But if you're in a position where other human beings are acting by force upon you, you're in a very different situation. <clears throat> Inevitably, this discussion eventually terminates in talking about land rights. And once we start getting into that discussion, we're going to need three hours. But uh, as with the question earlier on about cities and urbanization, you cannot get all the way down this path without doing land reform too. <clears throat> now, um, I am going to switch to a separate set of slides, assuming the software is going to behave. I've gotten so out of the habit of using Macintoshes, I can hardly find the buttons anymore. Uh, right. So, um, earlier when I mentioned copper. So, the situation with copper is absolutely astonishing. I only figured this stuff out about a month ago, and it just blows my mind. So, the total recoverable copper reserve, the economically recoverable copper reserve, is one kilogram per human. So, in a sustainable society, uh, in fact, in any society, if we're all going to consume roughly the same amount of copper, we're going to get about a kilogram each. Now, it may actually turn out to be closer to 10 kilograms by the time you have new technology and change your economically recoverable reserve estimates and all this kind of stuff. But does this explain why people are stealing copper out of the ground at every opportunity, why they're taking copper off roofs? Right? As more and more and more people are joining the global middle classes, the pressure on the planetary supply of copper goes up and up and up. Um, British Telecom, apparently, is now conceivably worth more as a copper uh, storage facility than it is as a telecom provider. Right? Because at the time, only the very rich countries were mining copper and using it, so we had an enormous concentration of the global copper reserve inside of the UK, which at the time was a dominant imperial power. Now, the rest of the world is beginning to want its share of the copper, and the copper which is in the ground in the UK is not accessible. Right? This is very weird. Can you imagine what civilization will look like when we've got you know, a very, very large global middle class all competing for very scarce copper reserves? It almost makes me think that I should sell my bitcoins and move into copper. Um, if we resolve this kind of scarcity using market pricing, what will happen is that copper speculation will become like land speculation. So an unproductive land market produces astonishingly high valuations. The money pours into land. The land is a not economically productive asset because it doesn't produce anything other than a very basic set of services from, say, housing. And as a result, your society stops investing in research and development, industrialization, R and you know, all the rest of these things. Right? 
So there is a profound problem in using standard market economics to solve problems of global resource scarcity because it results in a massive misallocation of capital that causes your industrial systems to collapse. This is the long economic cycle, right? People talk about, you know, the global economy just crashes every 30, 40, 60 years. What's driving that process is almost certainly the misallocation of capital inside of the market economy format. Is that a message for me? No. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, I wasn't sure whether you were passing me a note. Right. So, once we talk about the problem that we've got, this persistent tendency of the market to misallocate resources to non-economically productive things like massive long-term copper speculation, the question then is, what's the alternative? Right? We're in a position where the culture that we are in is dependent on massive uh, use of military force to maintain the wealth disparities on which our industrial system is based, and it's misallocating the necessary capital by which we could dig our way out of these kind of problems in a way that produces cycles of boom, then bust, then protectionism, then war then boom, then bust, then protectionism, then war, then boom, then this is what they call the economic cycle. So the point that I am attempting to make is this, right? You cannot solve these problems one at a time, right? It is almost certainly impossible to unpick consumer cryptography to give everybody in the world access to privacy without noticing that five billion of those people are being screwed by our governments because every time they try and charge a fair price for their natural resources, we assassinate their political leaders. It's one problem. It looks like 700 different problems. It's one problem. And the way that you get to the bottom of that problem is by analyzing where your stuff comes from your food, your water, your computers, your electricity, uh, everything. You track what you use back to its point of origin, and it goes through our free society for so many feet, and then at the edge of our free society, it gets into slavery or communism. Right? You track your natural resource tracking, you go through the store, you get to the store, you get out of the store, you get to the strip mine. You get to the enormous waste dump. <clears throat> Once you actually start following where the stuff comes from and where it goes in your own life, very quickly you begin to understand where the systems of oppression are operating and how you are supporting them by your very existence. Um, my friend Jay Springett coined a fantastic term for this kind of analysis. He calls it stacktivism. Right? Here is the stack of essential services that put together your world, and the political analysis of that stack and its externalities is stacktivism. So my contention is this. Tinkering with the layers of the stack individually is massively harder than doing it over. And you don't do it over by pulling the old one down. You do it over by building a new one prototyping it, bootstrapping it from the resources of the old, proving that it works, and then pulling the population across one at a time. Now, we've done this already in some areas, right? Wikipedia completely transformed access to human knowledge and the collaborative methods by which knowledge is produced more or less invisibly over 10 years. Wow. Okay, that's pretty substantial. And it's not, by the way, a coincidence that mainstream academia is absolutely collapsing at the same time as Wikipedia is becoming a completely uh, dominant global knowledge resource. That's not coincidence. Um, now, I'm not going to try and explain it because I'm not sure I understand it, but I'm pretty sure there's a correlation. Similarly, <laughs> stop giggling, Mr. McCarthy. Similarly, you look at the operating system market, right? You know, the internet, 50% of the stuff on the internet runs Linux, right? It's about 50%. Uh, it, Android is well over 50%. Um, you know, it's not that we are not having partial success as long as we are talking about software systems. We're, we're doing pretty well in the world of bits at displacing authoritarian structures from our lives. Now,
That's a very, very delicate claim, right? In the world of bits, not the world of atoms, we're making a pretty good job of displacing authoritarian structures from our lives. Problem, right? Firstly, the world of bits is actually just the world of atoms being taught to play tricks with electrons, right? It's actually all still fundamentally huge bloody server farms and pipes and cables that are controlled by people that we actually don't think like us because, you know, they're spying on us. Right? Problem number one. Problem number two, the assumption that uh, Wikipedia and Linux are not authoritarian. Right? If you look at Jimmy Wales or Linus Torvalds, these guys are basically robber barons. They're politically unaccountable. They're charging through the world on enormous piles of social capital, and they are forging forward to build a bold new destiny, etc., etc., etc. Right? They're absolutely stereotypical, you know, pirate kings. So we might in the long run have to ask whether a new generation of pirate kings that are supported by piles of social capital rather than piles of physical, you know, financial capital is necessarily progress. We might have to start talking about democratic representation inside of open source projects as a way of ensuring that the users and the contributors have some control over these, you know, rubber baron priest king guys. The, the pharaohs of our new age. But within that frame, right now, we are definitely displacing um, greater evils with massively lesser evils in the world of bits. Right? Um, and I think that that trend is very, very positive and very likely to be a reversible. So, this is a bit of a change of gear. I, I'm going to start talking about information theory and economics, but I'm going to try and keep it short. Thank you. Yeah, good. So, in the old feudal system, information and power are concentrated at the top through a feudal hierarchy. Decisions are made, and then information and decisions are pushed back down to all of the people that are actually implementing. Feudalism. Capitalism comes along, and capitalism has a many-to-many -many marketplace in which information is exchanged through price signaling. But price signaling is a very, very narrow offer. It only gives you a few bits of information about what's being said. Here's what we've got, here's how much it is, and the whole thing operates as a sort of partially stochastic search algorithm to produce an economically efficient society. Um, what's interesting about that is that command economies are essentially feudalism with a new a heuristic, whereas capitalism is a genuinely new thing. And the United States government in 1948 decided that they were going to fight communism by waiting for it to collapse because feudalism was unworkable at the scale of the Soviet Union. So that model has been used. It was in a paper called uh, The Long Telegraph by a man called George Kennan. And I heartily recommend reading that document. It's the foundational document of our current civilization. Like, it's why the Cold War happened, it's why the US won, it explains most of US foreign policy. The long telegram. Now, in the environment where you've got a rich network, heavy maps of social capital and so on, what's happening is that much more accurate and much more comprehensive communication is happening than price signaling. And as a result, more efficient and more effective systems are beginning to displace systems which work on price signaling. So my contention is that Wikipedia could not have been built with any amount of money. It doesn't matter how big your budget is when it comes in, when it comes out, you do not receive Wikipedia. <clears throat> um, once we get into the domain of social production of artifacts which are impossible to produce with money because of the inherent information theoretic limits of financial exchange as a way of allocating resources, we are now in a completely new ball game, right? Once you start out-competing the market, you are no longer talking about civil rights and capitalism is naughty and you know, it all runs on violence and all the rest of that stuff, which are moral arguments. You're talking about capitalism and the new thing get into a fight and capitalism loses, right? And Weirdly enough, capitalism has always been a live by the sword, die by the sword kind of an approach to life. So Encyclopedia Britannica and Windows get their ass kicked. Macintosh, Apple gets its ass kicked. 
And it turns out that this is a really important thing because once capitalism starts losing, you can start talking about the end of capitalism in a realistic way. Capitalism has already ended for certain of our critical utilities. We're not going back to running proprietary software. Capitalism has already ended for some of our critical utilities. Why not the rest? But what replaces capitalism is not feudalism. It's a more information-rich, more equitable system. If we're lucky. Right? Because we're either going to make the jump to that system or we're going to roll back to feudalism. Right? The rollback to feudalism is essentially the fascist movements that you see in places like Greece taking hold as the system begins to collapse there. It's a rollback to a previous authoritarian way of doing things. <clears throat> now, I have strayed a long way from talking about the Hexier, but this is actually very close to my core motivations in doing the Hexier project. I wanted to build a lifestyle where a single individual or a family could live at one planet's worth of consumption in relative comfort. That's the core design principle. What does a one planet lifestyle look like? One, two, three, four, five hexiarts for the family, water filter, organic agriculture, uh, extremely durable, long-lived computing devices that you have now and use for the rest of your life for at least a couple of decades. I am not suggesting that Western society immediately reverts to that lifestyle, right? I'm not suggesting that we go back to the land, that we go back to primary agriculture and all the rest of that stuff, not viable. What I am suggesting is this, five billion new people are going to get internet access within the next five to 10 years. The entire developing world is about to get online because the little 12 button feature phones are dying and they're being replaced by smartphones. And those smartphones are all internet connected on 3G, 4G, 5G mesh networks and what have you. So we're about to get five times as many people with ed involved in our entire global process. Three and a half times, right? Huge numbers of people are about to swarm into the conversation. The number of smart, talented, brilliant, funny people that can actually help start thinking about these global problems and start solving them is about to go through the roof. But we're also going to get into a position where they're about to start getting political educations because they're going to start asking, why does my life suck when I go on the internet and what I'm looking at is the New York Times website or Boing Boing, right? What does the internet look like if you're a poor child in an African village that just got a tablet that cost $11 and was printed on cardboard? Wow, right? The internet is a very self-indulgent place with a lot of very, very, very weird people looking at funny cat pictures while we completely ignore the state of the world and where the hardware is produced. If we don't grow up, and begin to seriously look at global problems and solving global problems as part of a necessity for a global network to exist, we are going to get rolled back to feudalism. Right? We have to roll forward. We have to start producing all of the basic necessities of life for everybody in the world, and the place where there is the most rapid, massive change socially, culturally, technologically is the villages and the slums of the poorer countries. So what I'm suggesting is this. The best route for us to find freedom is to make sure that the villages of the developing world get the highest possible standard of living by using the knowledge that they can get from the internet to transform the resources that they have political control over into the resources that they need. You get online, you build the little machines that it tells you to purify your water and to make your agriculture easier. You buy a few bits and pieces off the internet that are delivered like a little uh, cell phone charger that runs from the sun and some LED lights. Uh, you get basic medical information. You learn really interesting new things about agriculture that your culture never knew about because they didn't have microscopes. And within five to 10 years, your standard of living doubles or triples. And you haven't had to go out on the streets and march and start wars. And you haven't had to expose your kids to the risk of having a revolution in your country. <laughs>
You stay where you are, you massively enrich the knowledge that you have about how to live well in the world that you're in, and you become part of a global, global collaborative community that is not mediating your access to the material things you need to live through the financial markets. You begin to radically increase your standard of living and your standard of well-being, not through access to financial capital, but through access to knowledge capital. Right? And three or four billion people are going to go through that transition as soon as the smartphone hits their pocket. Five to ten years. Go and look at the statistics for cell phone adoption in the poor countries. You know, really seriously think about this stuff. Um, the people that I think are kind of at the spear point of this... Uh, lost connection. Oh, for God's sake. Show your website. No, maybe that works then. Say again. Apropedia.org. A P P R O P E D I A dot org. I don't know why it's not working. It's on the wrong network. No, it should be fine. I don't know. Anyway, Apropedia, it's basically a media wiki install on which people are collecting enormous amounts of information about appropriate technology. There are about 30,000, 40,000 pages right now. It's run by five part-time volunteers and gets very little attention. But actually, imagine if we built, in the time that we have before the cell phones arrive in the villages, imagine if we built an on-ramp, right? So we start working out in different countries in the world, what is it that they need to know? These guys grow cassava, this is the best practices for cassava. These guys have roundworm and hookworm, this is how you treat these things with the available materials. Right? We could actually start a global map of the information resources that people need to pull themselves out of poverty, and we could start preparing the information resources necessary for them to do that, and we could be doing that stuff now, and in the areas where there's been a bit more penetration of the network, like India, we could actually start talking to the Indians, many of whom live here, right? And we could start building the dialogues and building the negotiations about what is it you guys need, how are we going to get it for you, how are you going to learn to do this for yourselves? Ah, there's Apropedia. Nice timing. Perfect. So, right? That's basically my pitch in a nutshell. Right? We could really, really seriously change the entire structure of the world by creating an alternative to market capitalism, and that alternative could take root in all of the poor countries of the world, one village at a time, without putting heavy political pressure on anybody or starting a global war. If it works, we could go there to live in freedom, without having to fight against the governments here, which are slowly fading as the capital markets that they rely on for their existence degrade. Or we could bring those villages, and we could build them here, and we could live in them ourselves, because most of Europe has plenty of access to land. That's the best I got for you. <laughs>